The next section from Neil Knox, The Gun Rights War, page 58. The section is called The Dodd Bill, Both Fact and Fantasy, number two, July 1966. The anti gun clan has based its arguments on numerous subjects over the years crime, fifth columnists, gangsterism, firearms accidents extremist armies, even world peace and disarmament. But the moment has always relied on waving the bloody shirt of emotionalism. The present leader, Senator Thomas Dodd, a Democrat from Connecticut who claims that he is not anti-gun, is no exception. His administration-backed bill, S-1592, would clamp rigid restrictions and excessive fees upon dealers in firearms or ammunition, outlaw some big game rifles and many antiques, and eliminate interstate sales of firearms on all types to individuals. But many of the tragedies the senator relates to gain support for his bill would not have been averted or even affected by this proposal. Thus, it is apparent that his, he has plans for even stricter controls once he has succeeded in making S-1592 part of the law. However, Senator Dodd has added a new dimension to the old emotional gun control arguments, statistics, purporting to show that availability of guns has a direct relationship on the incidence of crime, particularly murder rates. An analysis in the first of these articles of the crime rates of five tight control cities and two light control cities selected by Senator Dodd showed that although fewer gun murders are committed where guns are closely controlled, the total number of murders is little affected. Robbery rates in Senator Dodd's good example cities were in most cases far higher than the bad example cities. Preliminary FBI figures for 1965 show that the number of murders in good example cities either remained virtually unchanged or increased as much as 50%, while murders in both the bad example cities decreased by a fourth. If the Dodd Bill were passed and the criminal could no longer purchase guns legally out of state, he obviously would steal them, make them, or buy them from an out-of-state bootlegger who could buy from dealers. Despite, despite Senator Dodd's claims, despite Senator Dodd's claims that the facts are on his side, he has deliberately ignored one of the few comparative or comprehensive analysis of the relationship of firearms laws to crime. In 1960, the Wisconsin legislature, legislature authorized the Wisconsin Legislature Reference Library to conduct a study to determine if they should, if that state should pass firearms control measures to further reduce its admirably low crime rate. That report, which includes several pages of detailed comparisons of crime to gun laws and other factors, concludes. From the foregoing statistics, it would be difficult to determine the effect that either licensing or non-licensing of firearms has on the extent of crime in a state, particularly on the murder rate per 100,000 population. Obviously, there are many factors which affect the murder rate. A comparison of the rate of murder with the density of population is inconclusive. Of the 24 states with the highest murder rate, 12 of them rank among the lower half, 15 of the 24 states with the highest murder rate also rank in the upper half in rate of robberies, while nine rank in the lower half. There seems to be more definite relationship between murder on the one hand and education and income on the other. Only seven of the 24 states with the highest murder rank rate rank in the top half in median years of schooling completed and in the income while 17 rank in the lower half of these items. The report notes that while licensing states appear to have 
a slightly better record with regard to the number of murders than the non-licensing states. Wisconsin, a non-licensing state, has one of the lowest murder rates in the nation. The results of this study further shatter Senator Dodd's thesis and introduced social problems which show definite relationship to crime rates. The FBI crime reports state that crime is a social problem and warns readers against drawing conclusions from direct comparisons of crime figures between individual communities without considering factors involved. Senator Dodd has ignored this preface statement, and he and the others who contributed to almost half a million words of testimony and statements during the 1965 hearings also ignored or failed to notice an FBI statistic that closely relates crime, particularly murder, to social and economic conditions. In 1964, FBI reports over one and a half of the one over one half of the victims of murder were Negro and over one half of the arrests for murder were Negro. More specifically, 53% of the murder victims were Negro. Uh, I'm just reading what's in here. And 58% of all persons arrested for murder were Negro. These figures are not included to stir any feelings or of racial bias, bias, but to emphasize that crime breeds and grows in areas with social and economic problems. The social and economic problems of the Negro under close scrutiny of Congress and the public for several years are commonly known. Yet it is difficult to realize that an ethnic group that compromises less than 10% of the nation's population is responsible for well over half of the nation's murders. The murder rate in Atlanta, Georgia, according to the 1964 report, was 11% matched only by other southern cities where Negro populations are high. The 1964 Atlanta Police Department report shows 106 persons murdered, 81 were Negro and 25 white. There were only five cases of murder between the races. With a better understanding of the social and economic conditions that play such a major part in murder, it is easier to understand why the vast majority of murders are within the family and between acquaintances. Family members killing each other accounted for 31% of all the murders in 1964. Another 22% of murders were classified as romantic triangles or lovers' quarrels. In more than 80% of all murders, the victim and assailant knew each other. In 1963, reports showed that the use of guns in this type of murder was higher than other categories, with 60% of murders within the family committed with firearms. Eliminating guns from homes of persons with low education, backgrounds, and low income levels might reduce the number of drunken brawl murders by whatever extent a firearm is more deadly than a chair or butcher knife. But such a law would clearly be discriminatory and unconstitutional. Advocates of strict gun control laws cannot hope to pass members measures directed to the problem areas, so they attempt to pass legislation to reduce or eliminate firearms in all homes. As such legislation would obviously affect sportsmen without mater uh, materially affecting the murder rate, for as evidence shows sportsmen will obey the law while the category of people that the law is attempting to reach is the group least likely to obey these laws. In most cities, brawls, knifings, and shootings in residences rate no in, in residences rate no more than three or four paragraphs in the newspaper, even when someone is killed. But a murder during an armed robbery, burglary, or other felony crime is page one news, carried by the wire services and offer, often with gruesome pictures of the victim. This category of crime, classified as a felony murder by the FBI, is, relatively, uh, is a relative rarity. Firearms were used in 44% of the 1,100 felony murders during 1963, about 480 gun deaths of about 4,700 murders. For comparison, 720 people died in traffic during the three-day 1965 Christmas weekend. 
During the year, 49,000 were killed and 1.8 million were disabled in auto crashes. In 1964, felony murders increased to 1,350, but for some reason the number committed with firearms is not included in the FBI report. This may be an indication of even smaller percentages of firearms use for whatever possible the writer of the FBI reports editorializes upon the use of firearms in crime. The highest incidence of criminal misuse of firearms is the felony murder of police officers, many of whom were shot with their own guns. During the five-year period from 1960 to 1964, 225 police officers were murdered, 96% with firearms. Senator Dodd frequently quotes this figure, but he fails to mention that 78% of the 294 persons involved in these police killings had previous arrests for assaultive type crimes such as rape, robbery, assault with a deadly weapon, assault to kill, assault on a police officer. Six officers were murdered by men who had been convicted on earlier murder charges and later released on parole. Seven were killed by persons convicted and later paroled on charges of assault to kill. The 1964 report states convictions had been recorded for 70% of the 294 responsible persons on some criminal charge and one half had received some sort of prior lenience during their criminal careers. Almost one third of the killers were on a parole or probation when they murdered the police officer. The public as jurors and selectors of judges and parole boards has allowed leniency and coddling of criminals who have returned to the streets to kill. Can any responsible person argue that the tool these killers used was responsible for the killings? If there is a cause and effect relationship between the availability of firearms and the murder and robbery rate, why is there such a great discrepancy in the murder and robbery rates of Dallas and Milwaukee, which have similar populations and similar lax firearms regulations? Why does Weak Law, New Hampshire, have one of the lowest murder rates while Weak Law, Georgia, has one of the highest? The two states have almost identical population density, although the New Hampshire has a larger percentage of residents in urban areas where crime figures are usually higher. Why are crime rates higher in Massachusetts with tight firearms control laws than they are in the border states with weak laws? Why do cities that Senator Dodd selected and cited for having tight firearms control laws continue to have crime rates above the national average? His figures showed that firearms murders can be reduced by prohibitive legislation, but the total number of murders are not. In a firearm, if a firearm is a cause of murder, were the knives, hammers, clubs, nylon stockings, and other instruments of death the cause of the half of murders that were not committed with firearms? Would even total prohibition of firearms affect the largest category of firearms murder in the home and between relatives and loved ones? Would the number of killings be materially decreased? Would any prohibition type legislation prevent experienced criminals from acquiring and using firearms? Liquor prohibition didn't work. This type of legislation has been attempted for half a century. It has not worked. It will not work. In the long past, it is long past time for lawmakers to consider other methods of controlling crime. Senator Dodd and the majority of S152. 1592's backers claim they aren't interested in curtailing the legitimate activities of sportsmen. They only want to end senseless and wanton murders and other gun crimes. Thus, they have the identical goal of the firearms enthusiasts. The controversy is limited to the method to be used in achieving this goal. Wouldn't it be logical approach to stopping illicit use of firearms to be provide more secure and certain punishment to the user? Such a bill has been proposed and is hardly endorsed by the NRA and other sportsmen's group. Representative Bob Casey's proposed amendment to the Federal Firearms Act, H.R. 11427, states, Whoever during the commission of any robbery, assault, or murder, rape, burglary, kidnapping, or homicide, or other involuntary manslaughter, 
uses or carries any firearm which has been transported in interstate commerce shall be imprisoned for not less than 10 years for the first instance or less than 25 years for the second offense. Since virtually every firearm has been transported across a state line at some time, this law would make the use or carrying of almost any gun in a major crime a federal offense. If any would doubt the effectiveness of such a bill, consider the impact of the Lindbergh Law, which has severe penalties for the interstate transportation of a kidnapped victim and the provision for the FBI to assist in investigation of all kidnapping cases. Stiff penalties and high probability of arrest and conviction reduce kidnapping for ransom from a lucrative criminal trade to a rarity. The Casey bill would do the same thing for criminal misuse of firearms. Senator Dodd calls the proposed a gimmick and sees the, and to, gimmick to see that no new legislation is passed. He is quoted as saying, such a law, if strictly enforced and, up, and if upheld by the courts, would present staggering administrative problems. He contended that federal law and enforcement staffs would have to be tripled and the capacity of the federal prisons increased by a half. Maybe it would, maybe it would, and maybe it wouldn't. He is overlooking the reason for the bill to reduce criminal use of firearms. If it works, the extra force and prisons wouldn't be necessary. If it doesn't work, crime would be pre- Wait, if it doesn't work, crime would be reduced by eliminating repeaters who serve two to three years in a state prison before being freed to rob and murder. This nation can well afford to solve the administration problems. We have one federal aviation agency employee for every two licensed private aircraft in the United States. And if that is what it takes to control crime, we can do it. The bill would work, and after a few of their cohorts had been provided long federally financed vacations, a criminal wouldn't touch a gun with a 10-foot pole. Testimony during the 1965 hearing showed that there are non-criminal areas of firearms abuse that should be corrected with additional regulation of firearm sales. One of these is that juveniles are able to purchase firearms in circumvention of local laws. This could be stopped by a requirement that notarized statement be attached to the order stating that the buyer would not be receiving the firearm in violation of local laws. Residents of large cities have little need for mail order purchase, but rural residents and citizens of smaller towns often must buy by mail if they are to have a wide selection of makes and models. This method of control would allow the law abiding to buy where they choose. No such legislation has been proposed, but a similar system is being used without benefit of law in Washington, D.C. through an arrangement by Washington Police, the U.S. Attorney Office, and Railway Express Agency. Passage of the measures in the Casey Bill would accomplish all that Senator Dodd and the administration seek to accomplish. Hunters, shooters, and collectors would be benefited. Within a short time, criminal use of firearms would be as rare as kidnapping. Juveniles and mental incompetence would not easily acquire firearms in violation of local laws. Criminals wouldn't want them. Extremist groups could not legally acquire or own live military ordnance without payment of heavy transfer and registration fees. Ownership of pistols, rifles, and shotguns for hunting, recreation, and home protection would not be affected. Evidence that laws aimed at criminal users of firearms will reduce crime might eventually result in relaxing stringent gun control laws. Hunters and shooters must recognize that existing legislation is not adequate to control increasing problems in crime or criminal and other misuses of guns. The measures outlined, outlined offer only the effective solution acceptable to sportsmen. The alternative is to continue to argue against ever more stringent gun control laws until privately owned guns are extinct. The guys and gals of gunwebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching gunwebsites.com.